So good to see everybody. Um, it's an incredible to have these incredible master musicians who are able to share their artistry with us and uplift us. I don't know about you, but uh, I got to give y'all a big round of applause, man. Amazing. Amazing. So I was thinking as I was backstage listening to them and these incredible pieces of music about uh, these heroes um, that we know so well, Nelson Mandela, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As a student in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, our most eminent graduate um, at Morehouse College was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And there's a huge uh, statue of him, likeness of him in front of uh, King Chapel. And uh, I remember walking past that time and time again and being inspired by his legacy. And also, of course, Mr. Nelson Mandela, who we all know, inspired by his commitment to social justice and to freedom and equality. And while these men are giants, and also the women who were their contemporaries were giants in the constellation of freedom fighters, we know that their struggles have deep roots, right? that they don't just spring out of nowhere, that they come from somewhere deep inside a people who have had this long march uh, in this, what Dr. King sometimes called the wilderness known as America. And as I'm thinking about the struggles led by Mandela, led by King, people like Ida B. Wells, Rabbi Jacob Heschel, Mahatma Gandhi, and others. I'm thinking that you all don't have to look too far living in this community for touchstones of inspiration in terms of freedom struggle. I'm thinking about a place called Dunbar Creek that is just up the road, where in 1803, a profound, a profound statement of civil disobedience took place. What is often called the first Freedom March. Dunbar Creek, also known as Ebo Landing. And it was there, and we all know this story very well, and if you don't, you should know, but you'll learn about it today. That in 1803, a group of enslaved Africans purchased at the Port of Savannah, boarded a boat for a ride over to St. Simon's Island where they were to contribute their labor forcibly into the plantation economy. Now, in terms of providing some context for this story, it's important, a few points are important to, uh, to cover here. First of all, the nature of the people that were being enslaved in this particular group called the Igbo. Now, the Igbo people, in case you don't know, come from the western coast of Nigeria, from a place called the Bight of Biafra, or the Bight of Bani. Now, roughly 16.5% of all enslaved Africans came from the Bight of Biafra, and many of them were Igbo. Now, those who were enslaving these individuals probably should have done some reading or research work on Igbo culture before they sought to enslave them. Because the Igbo are known to have a particular makeup of character that makes them particularly difficult to enslave. You see, the Igbo are very proud people, very stubborn people. They cherish their liberty and their freedom. And so as they were being transported over to St. Simon's Island, that quality of character expressed itself. And these enslaved Igbo overthrew the crew and tossed them into the creek where some of them drowned. But the most profound part of this story took place after that. You know, when it comes to often marginalized populations in this country, we stigmatize acts of civil disobedience, right? 
in which we are using force to overthrow our captors. We'll say things like, they're being violent. But when we're talking about America, we call it revolution. It's a profound contradiction there. Those Igbo, as the boat was coming into Dunbar Creek, led by one of the elders in the group, a chief, disembarked from the boat, walked towards the shore. This chief looked around, and the conclusion that he drew for himself was that this is no place for us. We will not be enslaved. In fact, we would rather die than be enslaved. And turning around, he led those other Igbos back into Dunbar Creek where they drowned. Hence the name Igbo Landing. The first recorded march of resistance of freedom in this country. So thinking about Mandela, thinking about King, thinking about Gandhi, Ida B. Wells, thinking about Harriet Tubman, we see that there is an inspiration that they can draw on, that we can draw on, that they drew on, in terms of their engagement in their fight for liberation and equality. And it extends far back to a root, to roots in West Africa, to roots in the Deep South, to roots in a small body of water called Dunbar Creek. And it's up to us to remember these touchstones of inspiration as we go about our own engagement in building a more just and equitable community. One that's predicated on a oneness of humanity. Because we know that February, 28 days, is not enough to encapsulate black history. And indeed, we also know, we also know that black history is everybody's history. That as King said, in some way, we're all bound together. We're all tied together from some inescapable network of mutuality bound together in a garment of destiny, and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Now, for some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. No man in his eyes is an island unto himself. Each man a piece of the continent, a part of the whole. And then he goes on towards the end to say, any man's depth diminishes me for I'm involved in mankind. Therefore never seek to know for whom that bell tolls, because it tolls for thee. Let us remember our heroes in heroines. Let us celebrate the legacy of these great freedom fighters. Let us never forget let us remember King and Mandela and Ida B. Wells and Harriet Tubman and Mahatma Gandhi and Rabbi Jacob Heschel and so many others. And let us remember what was sacrificed in Dunbar Creek. Let us remember Igbo Landing.